I was standing back there while Brother Russell was reading, and it popped in my mind after, you know, I don't know how long, it went by three to four minutes or so, and I realized, like, man, this is a long chapter. And then the very next thing that came into mind, if you look at the chapter itself, each individual verse, they're pretty long. And then the next thing that popped into my mind was, we're blessed that we have this system where all of these children and all these adults just sit in their seats while we have a man come up here and read the Bible for five to ten minutes while you just listen to it. You know, I grew up in the church that I went to. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. It's a great church in a lot of other ways. But I'm, I, you know, I, I love that system of, of that operation of where we stand up here and we have someone just read the Bible for five to ten minutes. All the children... All the adults, if, maybe if you, if you haven't been reading your Bible lately, you get to at least hear the Bible reading right there. Amen. Look here in Joel chapter number 2. I want to look there. Famous passages are quoted in the New Testament, of course. Joel chapter number 2, and it's verse number 28. The Bible says, and it, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject of visions and dreams. Visions and dreams. People seeing visions throughout the Bible. We're going to look at all the examples of this. We're going to learn a lot of doctrine from this. And, and this is a subject I've never heard a full sermon on. But it's a subject that's talked about all throughout the Bible. You may or may not notice this. And I guarantee a lot of these passages, when we look at them today... You're like, man, I didn't even realize that that was a vision. I didn't even realize that that was a dream. So if you divide your Bible up, Old Testament and New Testament, the Old Testament constitutes roughly two-thirds of your Bible. And the majority, the vast majority of the prophecies that come to the men of God come to them through a vision or they come to them through dreams. I believe that this is oftentimes ignored by many Baptist preachers, many biblical churches of saved Christians, because it's abused by other churches that aren't saved, other churches that, you know, uh, where they're, they're preaching all other sorts of false doctrine, where they're not even true, it's not even true Christianity. But let me say this, that's not a reason to avoid subjects like this. What we need to do is we need to preach the doctrine, like I'm going to do in this sermon, and then at the end of the sermon, I'm going to cover for just a few minutes all the abuse of all these verses and things like that. So here, I want you to go, we're here in Joel 2, I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37, where I want you to go next. Genesis chapter number 37, I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter number 15. This is the first mention of the word vision in the Bible. The first mention of the word vision. It says this in Genesis 15, 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, when you read down through that chapter, you may or may not have noticed this, but what, when uh, Abraham is getting saved, this is actually when Abram gets saved, before he is given the name Abraham, that whole uh, period of time when God's speaking to him, God's appearing to him in a vision, it tells you. God says in verse number one that he came to him there in a vision. You may or may not have noticed that. Even some of the, the prophets will begin their books in the, in the Old Testament, and they will explain that the word that I'm writing was a vision that I received. Isaiah chapter number one, verse number one, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Nahum chapter number one, verse number one says this, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. So that is, uh, we see that repeatedly. You see that these men, these, the, the prophets, when they're writing, they're saying, hey, the word of the Lord that I'm getting ready to write right now, I actually received this first in a vision. Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 3. Genesis chapter number 20, verse number 3. I'll read you, you don't have to turn to this. This is the first mention of the word dream. It says, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, if you didn't notice already from Job chapter number 2, verse number 28, uh, the words vision and dream are actually interchangeable. Those words are used interchangeably throughout the Bible. I'm going to read to you one other text. I forgot the copy here. But it's Joel, or Job, I'm sorry, Job chapter number 20. You don't have to turn there. You can stay there in our, our first text that we'll begin in, in Genesis 37. But Job 20, verse 8 is a good proof of dream and vision being synonymous. It says this, He shall fly away as a dream. Now he's going to repeat the same statement. 
and shall not be found, yet he shall be chased away as a vision of the night. So notice the exact same statement is used. Talking about flying away, being chased away. So fly and chase are synonymous. You know what else is synonymous? is dream and vision. God will come sometimes to people in dreams, but this is also synonymous with him coming to him them in visions. So you're here in Genesis chapter number 37. Genesis chapter number 37. We're going to begin reading in verse number 5. Genesis 37 Verse 5, it says this, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. Now he goes on to describe in great detail the dream that he had. You may or may not be familiar with this. We're, we're going to keep reading, but it's very detailed. It says this, For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose. And also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. I want you to notice what it said there. Why did they hate him? We're going to look at this deeper here in just a moment. I'll show you a couple real interesting verses. It says that they hated him for his dreams and for his words. What we have, when we look at the Bible, obviously, we have words here, don't we? But first, these, these words originated as visions most of the time. These words originated first as, as a dream or as a vision that was given to a man. And then he took that vision and he wrote it down. God, through the Holy Spirit, of course, inspired the words of the vision that God gave him. God chose, when he gave revelations, to do it via a, a dream or through a vision. I want you to go now to Genesis chapter number Genesis chapter number 46. Genesis chapter number 46. As I said, it originates as a dream or a vision, and then it becomes the word of God. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 2. It is the word of God through the vision and through the dream, but it's then written down in the written word of God. Let me word it that way. Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 2. Listen to this. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he, that he may run that reading. And notice, he said, Write the vision. So first, it was, written, it was a vision. The word of God came to him through the vision, and then he took the vision and he wrote it down. You're in uh, Genesis chapter number 46, verse number 2. I want you to see how he deals with all of his prophets this way. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here am I. Notice the visions of the night. When you sleep, what do you do at night? You dream, of course. We have the example of, of Abraham as well. Uh, just, just after Genesis chapter number 15, Abraham, God calls a great sleep to fall upon, a deep sleep to fall upon Abraham. It's the same exact wording that's used with Adam when God removes the rib. And you know what happens? He gives him a vision and a dream, a horror of night he talks about, right? And he sees all of these, all of these uh, visions and these, and these uh, dreams about his descendants that are going to be going forth in slavery for 400 years. How did he receive the word of God there as well? <coughs> through a vision, through a, through a dream. <clears throat> you turn to where? Genesis 46? Genesis 46. Let's go now to Genesis chapter number 40, verse number 6. Let's go there. Genesis chapter number 40, verse number 6. Look at these verses here. They're all together. We're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning. Genesis chapter number 40. We're going to look at verse number 6. We're going to read quite a bit of text here. We saw before where Joseph was dreaming dreams. And these dreams were the word of God, weren't they? They were prophecies that were going to be coming. So it was the dream first. The vision first came like we saw in the back end. And it was the word of God and the vision, but then it's later written down. Well, not only did, was Joseph dreaming dreams or visions that were given from God that were the word of God, God would also you know, convey a vision or a dream to another person so that Joseph would interpret those dreams. I want you to look in Genesis chapter number 40. So Joseph had a spiritual gift to interpret dreams or visions from God. Genesis chapter number 40, look at verse number 6. It says this. And Joseph came in unto them, unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. 
Verse number 11. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. So I want you to think about this concept, what just took place. So the, you have the butler, and he is dreaming a dream at night, right? He's, he, he has a dream. He has a vision. You have the baker that does so as well in this passage. We're not going to keep reading but he has this dream or this vision at night that God gave him specifically. Well, God also gave this gift, this spiritual gift unto Joseph, where he has the ability, and think about this word, to interpret dreams. Now, when he interprets it, it starts off as a dream, but how does it end? How does it end? What, how does he convey the thought to him? Does he, does he do a dance? No, he, he tells him it in words, doesn't he? So notice, it begins as what? It begins as a vision. What is a vision? It's something you visibly look at. This is the word of God in a vision. And then what does it end up as? It ends up as words. So he interprets it. He, he, he interprets it from the vision. And he explains in words what it is. That's the exact same thing that we see happening in, in Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 2. When he says, the vision that I gave you, I want you to take it and I want you to write it down and make it plain on tables. The Word of God, the majority of the time in the Old Testament, when it came to prophets and when it came to the holy men of God, it came to them through visions. It came to them through dreams. And you know what they did? God, through the Holy Spirit, interpreted it and wrote it down through the Word of God. Where it's actually the written Word of God. We see this over and over again. I want you to turn also to Daniel chapter number 1. Very similar situation with Daniel, of course. Daniel chapter number 1. He was given this exact... Uh, you know, uh, spiritual gift that Joseph also had. Daniel chapter number one. Right after the book of Ezekiel. Daniel chapter number one. Notice what it says about Daniel here. In Daniel chapter one, look at verse 17. It says for this, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. So God's giving this. And then it says this, And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Notice again, visions and dreams are synonymous. And we see here that Daniel has understanding in all visions and dreams. Go over while we're here in the book of Daniel. Go to verse number 28 of chapter 2. Daniel 2, 28. Look at Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 28. It says this, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Verse 29, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me... This secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have, more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. You see the great humility of Daniel, by the way. There's a side thought. We see here that he has this ability or this wisdom that was given him from God. Not any wisdom that he has, but it's just a wisdom or an understanding that's given him directly from God. A spiritual gift. Go over to Daniel chapter number 4. Daniel chapter number 4. Look at verse number 5. Look at verse number 4 first. And Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. One other thing I want to point out to you is how you keep seeing thoughts, too. It's just, it's just like a thought that they're having, just like a vision. Or a dream. You use the interchangeable there again. If you look at uh, Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 15. This is going to tie in with something we look at here in a few minutes. But I want you to notice how real all of these visions or these dreams are that they see. It seems as if this is, this is just equivalent to reality almost. Notice that it said that it troubled him or it scared him. We'll see this again in Daniel chapter number 7. Look at verse number... Verse number, I have 15 first, Daniel chapter number 7, verse number 15, it says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body. And then he says, and the visions of my head troubled me. That's the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar said. He talked about how the visions or the dreams that he saw, right, that he had at night, says that they troubled him. Look at verse number 7. 
Notice repeatedly these things are happening at night. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. I want you to go to first, or actually I'm going to read you from First Samuel chapter number 3. I'm going to have you turn to, uh, go to Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10. When Abraham had this dream in Genesis chapter number 15, it was at nighttime. He was sleeping, right? We see Daniel referring to he's sleeping. The butler, the baker, they're all asleep at this time. If we look up the time when Israel, that was Jacob that we read about earlier in Genesis, he was asleep. God will give these visions or these dreams at night just while they're sleeping. They're normally sleeping, and God will come to them in a dream or in a vision. This happens all throughout the Bible. We saw that with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar as well. So where did you turn? Acts chapter number 10. I'm going to read you from a couple of other places. Just 1 Samuel chapter number 3, verse number 1, it says this, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Numbers chapter number 24, verse number 4, this ties in with where you are there in Acts chapter number 10 and what I was just talking about, about them being asleep. Sometimes God will put someone into a trance where it's almost like they are in a sleeping state, and then he gives them a vision or a dream, showing that this is the same as when you are sleeping. Numbers chapter number 24, verse number 4, it says this, He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance. And then it says this, but having his eyes open. So that's pretty strange. I want you to look there in Acts. We're in Acts chapter number 10. We're going to begin reading in verse number 9. Acts chapter number 10, verse number 9. The Bible says this, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. That means he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So notice that same wording, the same thing that happened to what I read in, in Numbers 24, 4. It says in verse number 11 there in Acts 10, 11, and, and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto it, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Don't you notice how detailed each time these visions and these dreams are explained? Every time they're very detailed, there's specific things that are seen. It's almost as if He's in a form of reality. Look at verse number uh, 13. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Watch this. It's very interesting. But Peter said, notice that. He's in a dream right now. He's in a vision. You may or may not have thought about this, but he fell into a trance like as if he is just asleep. He's in a sleeping state. And God comes to him, and within this dream or within this vision, God is able to interact with him. And speak to him. He shows him these visions. He shows him these, these things that he can visibly look at and see. And God can speak to him and talk to him. But not only that, it doesn't, it doesn't end there. Peter also interacts back while he is in this vision. While he is in this dream. He speaks back to the Lord. Look at what it says in verse 14. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have neither eaten anything that is common were unclean. Verse 15, and the voice spake unto him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So this goes on and on for a few minutes. I'm going to read you from, uh, oh, actually, I'm going to have you turn back to the Old Testament again. Go to Ezekiel chapter number one, verse number one. We'll see this again. <clears throat> the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is just a big vision. The whole thing is just a big vision or a big dream. So John, in his dream or in his vision, he sees a seven-headed beast come up out of the sea, doesn't he? He looks and he sees this. It comes up out of the sea and stands on the shore of the sea. A seven-headed beast that has you know, seven heads and has the, the, uh, the seven crowns it talks about. It also talks about ten crowns, right? You know, and the horns that's on its head. He looks at this and he sees this within his vision. Why don't you look here at Ezekiel chapter number one, verse number one. Ezekiel chapter number 1, verse number 1. Notice the word of God came to Ezekiel also in a vision or in what we would call it like a dream. It says in verse 1, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were open, and he says, And I saw visions 
of God. I want you to go to chapter number 8, verse number 3. Ezekiel chapter number 8, verse number 3. Ezekiel chapter number 8, verse number 3. This is very interesting too. Let's read verse 1 as well, 1 through 3 here. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. So as he's seeing visions, isn't he? It says, as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins, even downward, fire. And from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. Look at verse 3. And he put forth the form of a hand. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. There's a couple of things that are real interesting. Within this vision, God reaches down with his hand. He has a hand reached out, and it grabs a hold of him. Notice how he interacted through speech before, right? Verbally, he interacted. But in this case, he reaches down with his hand, and he grabs a hold of him in the vision and picks Ezekiel up by the head of his hair, doesn't he? It says that he took him in the visions. It says this in verse number 3. Lifted me up in between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem. So people, when they're brought in these visions, they see real things. And they, they will interact with God. God will interact with them. And they will oftentimes even interact with other people within these visions. Like in the book of Revelation as well is another great example. Like the whole book is basically a vision. They're brought to the future, aren't they? They're brought to the future. And it's, it's, it's very interesting because in some cases, like with Ezekiel, he shows up and he looks around the temple, but it's almost like nobody else can see that he's there. Because he observes other people, he walks around, he looks around. It's almost like, you know, it's maybe poor wording, but like he's in this other dimension or something like that. Where he's able to go to these places in a sense of reality, right? He's really there. God's really speaking to him. He's really picked up by the hairs of his head. He's brought there in the visions, what he sees in all of this. Just like when uh, John, in a sense, of course, John was really brought to heaven, wasn't he? But, you know, of course this happened through visions. All these things were happening, you know, one right after the other. That's why he says he was in the spirit, right? John was in the spirit. Here we see that he was brought in the visions of God to Jerusalem. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 40, verse number 2. Ezekiel chapter number 40, verse number 2. Ezekiel chapter number 40, verse number 2. Read verse number 1 also. It says, In the five and twentieth year of our captivity... In the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me. Notice that's the exact same thing he said in Ezekiel 8, isn't it? Talking about the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him and being the Spirit, like John says. And brought me thither in the visions of God, brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain, by which was as the frame of a city on the south. Now, if you compare Scripture to Scripture and you look at Revelation chapter number 21, this is almost exactly what happens to John. He's brought up in a very high mountain. And does anyone remember here, just off the top of your head, what he sees in Revelation 21, what John sees when he's brought up into a very high mountain? He, he, goes, he sees, what did you say? New Jerusalem. Yeah, New Jerusalem. Yeah, he sees the bride, the lamb's wife, right? And he says, he brought me out. I think it says exceeding high mountain, maybe, in Revelation 21. I feel like the wording is a little bit different, right? So we see here when it happened to Ezekiel, how did it happen? It says that he, in the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel. So it's in the visions of God. Wouldn't it make sense that when it happened to John, the safe assumption would be that it was in the visions of God, right? All of that, what he was seeing, when he's looking at this beast, when he's looking at this woman riding the beast, right, that these are in the visions of God. But, but notice how there is this aspect of reality to it at the same time. It's a very hard thing to understand when you read about the visions and how they happen and how they are really, they're communicating, aren't they? God is really responding to him. He is really responding back. He is, in a sense, really taken to Jerusalem and he observes real events in the future. That's why I said it's interesting. It almost seems as if 
Not to get all sci-fi on you, but it almost seems as if he's put into like this other dimension, isn't it? Where he's brought, in a sense, in reality, but it's a vision where he's brought there. Where he observes these events, he actually sees them take place from beginning to end. It's exactly what happened. He watches it happen. He's able to stand there with another angel. You know, who are these that are arrayed in white land? Right? Revelation 7. So he sees these things actually happen. Real people stood there and he saw them, didn't he? But it happened in the visions of God. He's brought to Jerusalem in the visions of God. You know what he does? And then he ends up writing it down. While John is speaking in, in um, I believe it's Revelation chapter number 10. I didn't look this up. But while John is seeing the visions and talking to God, when the, 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 the thunders that utter, was it seven thunders that utter? He goes to write them down. So notice he's writing them down while he's in the vision at the same time. It's a hard thing to understand, isn't it? I want you to turn with me go to another passage here. This is going to kind of uh, uh, go to the, 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 the former portion of the sermon. Go to uh, Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 28. So God deals with real men and he gives them visions. But there's also a lot of people that, that will try to fake visions, aren't they? They'll probably try to lie because God, this is God's method of using visions. There's a lot of people out there that will just say, hey, I received a vision from God. I got a vision from God. I saw something. Let me tell you. You know, 90%, 99% of the visions you can call as a fraud immediately. There are all kinds of just red flags immediately. You know, like when, uh, like the little boy that claims that he died and he went to heaven and he saw heaven. You know, if you read about that kid's account of what he claims that he saw, there are so many things that just contradict the Bible. So many things of, of, of what he claims that he saw that just contradict the Bible. Now, I don't know what would cause a boy to say things like that. You know, the Bible talks about young children being devil possessed. That may make you uncomfortable, but that happens. Maybe that's what it was, so he could lead people further astray, the devil that is. Number two, it could be that someone is, you know, uh, feeding him this garbage and trying to use this child to make a lot of money. That's what I always thought. That, you know, who, of course, if your child has this big, long, elaborate story that he's able to articulate about dying and going to heaven, and he did actually have some sort of medical procedure take place, and you coached him through all of this and got him to say all of this afterwards, don't you think that'd be all in the news? Don't you think you'd be able to profit off that book? That kid's not getting all that money, I'm sure about that. That's probably what happens. But you know what? There are a lot of people that just go out there. To, and, and they lie about the word of God. Some just do it just because they have ill intentions to hurt other people. A lot of them, right? And it can be a combination of things. Some just want to be, they want to rise to some sort of prominence. Personal prominence or personal reputation of, hey, I had a vision from God. But either way, they're all false prophets. Either way, they're all lying. Either way, whatever their backstory is and the reason why they did so, that's irrelevant when it comes to whether they're telling the truth or whether they're lying. The Bible talks about there are people, and, and this is just one example, but there are people all through the Bible that, that pretend to be a prophet of God. And they pretend that God comes to them and that God tells them things. And because God deals through visions, people will say, hey, you know what? I received a vision too. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 23. Jeremiah chapter number 23, we're going to look at verse number 28. Jeremiah 23, look at verse number 28, what it says here. <clears throat> look at, yeah, look at verse, uh, actually, let's begin reading 24. Let's begin reading verse 24. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? So did they really dream a dream? No, they just lied and they made it up, didn't they? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Verse 27. Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor. Notice what is the purpose of these dreams that they're having. The whole purpose they claim they're having, that they're telling people that they're having. The whole purpose is given in verse number 27. <clears throat> there are still people here today that, that the only reason why they say, hey, I had a dream, let me tell you about it. You think it's coincidence that it contradicts the word of God? No, it's to lead you astray from this book. And there are people out there that would put more stock in some child's dream, that would put more stock in some woman saying that she had a dream, or some old man saying that he had a vision, than they would in the Word of God. 
They would say, hey, I believe his dream or I believe his vision over this child or, 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 I, or over the word of God. Over the word of God, they would believe a person's dream or vision that they say. While this was going on in the past, and God called out the false prophets about it. Look at verse 28 now. It says, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? So God says there in verse number 28, Those that did have a dream... Those that do have my word, and notice what's used interchangeably there again. Look at, look at, let's look at that real quick, verse 28. It says, let, it says, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And then he repeats it. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chapter of the week? Say it for Notice the dream is the word, isn't it? The dream comes, and then he's, he's speaking it, and he interprets it as the word of God. We see this all throughout the Bible. But what's God, what God is saying here is <clears throat> those that actually did have a dream, let him speak the, the words of the dream. Those that had a dream, let him tell everyone about the dream. Those that have my word, they that have my word, let them speak my word. I want you to go, we're gonna, since we're here in the Old Testament, let's go back to where we began, Joel 2, and then we'll look at when this is quoted, when it's actually fulfilled in Acts chapter number 2. The Joel Amos Obadiah, right there. The Minor Prophets, go to Joel, chapter number 2. So those that abuse these things, of course, would fall into the category of what's considered the Charismatics, wouldn't they? The Pentecostals. And, and don't, you know, a lot of people, you know, a, a lot of Baptists, and it's so, so weird, a lot of Baptists, tons of Baptists, even fundamental Baptists, will look at the Pentecostals like they're very close to what we are today. They're not even near what we are today. And I'll tell you the reason why, Baptists I'm saying, they're not even near a Baptist. And the reason why people will look at Pentecostals, I believe, is a couple things. Number one, most of them will use the King James Bible, number one. And number two, and this is a terrible reason, but number two is because they're somewhat fundamental, aren't they? Pentecostals are somewhat fundament fundamental in ways, aren't they? They're fundamentally wrong. So that means nothing. But Pentecostals are about what they believe. They're fundamental. They're not more like like a like a, if you think of like a non-denominational or something like that. But you know what? The Jehovah's Witnesses are fundamental about what they believe too, aren't they? So is the Church of Christ. So is the Mormons. They're fundamental. So what does that mean? And that I believe is why the Baptists will look at the Pentecostals, even though they have a damnable gospel, even though you know they have all of these terrible teachings. And, and, and you'll notice the reason why I bring this up right now is you'll notice how often I have to name the Pentecostal denomination from behind the pulpit. They're very bad. They're nowhere near where we are. They're nothing even similar to a Baptist. They're very bad. We preach about the visions and the dreams. The Pentecostals come up. We preach about people twisting the tongues and what the tongue's about. Pentecostals come up. We pre preach about people you know, saying that you should trust in your baptism to get you to heaven. The Pentecostals come up. Over and over and over again. The, the epitome of a self-righteous Pharisee is a Pentecostal. It's, it is the epitome of a self-righteous Pharisee. That's, that's why, why their church services even exist. Those people love going to church so much to try to show off their supposed spiritual gifts. Their, their lies of spiritual gifts. Right. That is what they live for. They're a self-righteous Pharisee. The Pentecostals are super wicked. They are mm -hmm. nothing like a Baptist. Don't ever fall into this crap. I don't care if my wife is at a food bank and a Pentecostal is at a food bank and they look similar. They're nothing alike. They believe nothing like. Right. Nothing. That woman believes nothing like my wife. You know, I don't care if they're fundamental. So you know what? Sometimes, you know, when we go to the door and tie and everything, people think I'm a Jehovah's Witness. But guess what? I'm going to heaven and they're not. I'm a child of God and they're not. I don't care if they're fundamental. I don't care if they actually believe what they teach, you know, whether they believe the things that they teach and the things that they say, and they believe, you know, the, I don't care if a, if a Jehovah's Witness actually believes the New World Translation. That means nothing to me. Whether he actually practices what he believes, and maybe they have a good dress code, and they act formal in ways, then they, what does that mean to me? You need to not be so shallow about things where you fall, just because they look fundamental, they look like us all their life, but they're nothing like us. Right. They're nothing like us. You know, what, you know what the Bible talks about that Satan does? He transforms into an angel of light. You know what it's talking about specifically? 
him acting like an apostle. What a, what a Pentecostals do all the time. They want to try to act like they're an apostle. Apostolic. They, every time that we have a, you know, we have to preach against something, something needs to be warned about, you know what gets brought up? The Pentecostals. They are very wicked. Amen. They are filled with doctrines of devils. They, their, their church and their beliefs and religion is just filled with, with horrible teachings. They're so far from the true gospel, they're so far from the true faith of the Bible. Look here at Joel chapter number 2. I want you to again look at verse number 28, and we're going to go to Acts chapter number 2 where this is fulfilled. It says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit, I want you to watch this, upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2. If we would have kept, it would have kept reading there, it says this, And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. So I want you to go now to Acts. As I said, Acts chapter number 2. This is actually where this is fulfilled. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. A lot of people will look at this as their proof that they have visions today. Or their proof that they have dreams from God today. Look at Acts chapter number 2. Look at verse number 14. We'll read this. <clears throat> the, the, this story that takes place. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall shall dream dreams. Verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So many of the, the Charismatics, the Pentecostals, and all of them, they'll turn to this passage in order to try to prop up the doctrine that, hey, we still receive visions today. We're apostles. We're of that same line. We still receive dreams today. But as I've said a few other times already, this, this actual prophecy was fulfilled here in Acts chapter number 2. And one of the things that I want you to keep in mind is there are two prophecies that are mentioned here. And the reason why it says in those days is because there's a period of time. And what is that the period of time after Jesus, before he comes back? What is it referred to as? The last days. Over and over again, that's talking about the last days. So in the last days, these prophecies will be fulfilled. Now I want you to think about this quickly to understand. Because they would say, well, yeah, in those last days, so all throughout those last days. Well, hold on a second. The second prophecy that's going to be fulfilled that's quoted here is what? The sun and the moon being darkened. Now think about this. Does that happen multiple times or does that a one-time event that occurs? But it happens in the last days, doesn't it? Notice that this is quoted right here because this is one of the things that's going to take place within that perimeter, that period of time of the last days. And he says, this is that. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Now another thing that I want you to point out too is this. I want, you to, I want to point out and want you to understand is this. They think that just... Men and women are just having visions in their church. These small Pentecostal churches, like in the backwoods of Georgia or something. There's like three people in these churches, and, and they're having, you know, this great revival when a woman, the, you know, has a vision or a dream from God, right? That's not what this is teaching. This is a very specific event where he says this. That's why I emphasized this earlier. I inflected it. He pours it out upon all flesh is the point. Now, all there is, is in this context is talking about everyone that's there is thousands of people. That's the point. He's pouring it out upon, this is a special event. Now, I want you also to think about this. It talks about, it refers it as wonders. What is a wonder? 
It's a miracle, isn't it? It's a huge thing, isn't it? It's something like a miracle, isn't it? Kind of like the sun and the moon being darkened. It's not just one woman sitting there and, and having a vision or a dream, right? No, this is talking about hundreds, you know, tons of people. There's thousands of people that get saved, but hundreds of people that are here that are all the, the women and the men, that are the, the Christians that are saved, that are the, all of those believers that are gathered together, having the visions, having the dreams, and, the, and they're speaking the word of God. And another proof of that is that this is a myth. They're actually speaking... And it's 17 different languages. What is that? It's a miracle. This is a wonder. Look at what it says there in verse 19. And I will show wonders in heaven above. So notice how he's talking about that's a wonder, isn't it? That's a miracle. He's saying these are signs that will come to pass in the last days at some time. And then he said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So when we look at the other prophecy, that's a one-time occurrence of that event. This is a one-time occurrence of this event. This is a great miracle that took place where hundreds of these people, were, were the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were speaking the Word of God in 17 languages. And it was a miracle that took place in the last days. Look at verse number 9. This right here alone debunks all of these vision, dream-having you know, people of the Pentecostal movement. Because a lot of times they, they relate, what they do is they, they connect. They make it too easy for us anyways because they connect their vision and their dreams with their jibber jabber of their tongues, when they when you see their foolishness of trying, when, of, of misunderstanding basic things of the Bible, all you had to do was read the cover page to the King James Bible, and it tells you it's translated out of the original tongues to get the definition of the word tongues, Mister Pentecostal. That means languages. Look at verse number nine, verse number eight, and how hear we every man in our own tongue where we are, wherein we were born. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus, Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our, in our tongues. Look at this. The wonderful works of God. What does it say? It's a miracle. It's a sign. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. This is not something that happened repeatedly. Also, the second point that I want to make about it is this. When you look, in, what, is the, what is the New Testament? Let me say this. What is the New Testament equivalent of the Old Testament prophet? What was the New Testament equivalent? An apostle. Who, who wrote the New Testament? Apostles. And what were they called in the Old Testament? Prophets. Like in Ephesians, I believe I, I, I preached that in the Apostles' Sermon. Where there's, there's this uh, connection made repeatedly, like remember the things which were spoken by the prophets and of us, the apostles. He's talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's this connection made repeatedly, right? Well, the last apostle was the uh, apostle Paul that was added. That was the last apostle. You know who talks about seeing visions? And it's like 2 Corinthians uh, 11 or 12 or something like that. When he talking about when he went to heaven. Paul. Do you know who else is, talks about seeing a vision in the New Testament? Outside of this passage, which that's why this is a miracle. That's the point that I'm making. Because people other than those that were writing scripture. This doesn't happen to everyone. That's why I said it's upon all flesh here. The Old Testament, it was the prophets of God that spoke the word of God and wrote down scripture. And there were, there were rare case, uh, uh, occasions where this wasn't happening. Now you have all these, these charismatics... And these Pentecostals, where you got a church filled with 100 people, and 90 of them are seeing visions and dreams. In every church across America. It's such a joke of a movement. Right. Such a bunch of stinking liars. And they prophesy deceits out of their own heart is what they're doing. They're lying, and you have all these people, oh, it's a good-hearted woman. She's a liar. I don't care if it's your stinking grandma. If she's a Pentecostal, and she's saying that she saw a vision from God, she is a dirty, rotten liar is what she is. You know, I want you to turn, and this will be the last passage. I want you to turn to, to Deuteronomy chapter number 13. Saying that you are, that you are uh, you know, seeing a vision of God, after what we've looked at this morning, is equivalent to saying that you're given the words of God. Isn't it? That's wicked, man. Just say, hey, God gave me a word. God told me to tell you this. This is a word directly from God. This is on the level of Scripture. That's what they would say too, isn't it? Which You, you know why they would have to say that? Because... Like I said, all the people that see visions, what are they? It's the Word of God that's going to be written down, isn't it? That's what you see in the New Testament. The two people that, that have visions in the New Testament, John writes it down, Paul 
writes it down and tells you about it. Peter, Acts 10, writes it down and tells you about it. Then there's a miracle. Hey, I'm going to do this upon all flesh. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to have a sign and a wonder happen upon all flesh. This is that which was uh, uh, spoken of by the prophet Joel. It's fulfilled, my friends. Stop going around saying you're having visions and dreams. You're a liar. Heaven doesn't look like that anyways. You know, they're, they're describing heaven. It's nothing like what the Bible tells me that, that heaven is like. You couldn't, you couldn't dream a dream uh, out of your own heart or your own deceits and make something up better than what God does. Because heaven is amazing. You know, when you read, I love, one of my favorite just, you know, parts of the Bible is Revelation 21 and 22. It's just amazing. It gets me excited thinking about how great heaven will be. If you turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 13. I'm going to read you uh, from Jeremiah again. This is a, a topic that's discussed repeatedly throughout the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to read you from Jeremiah chapter 14, verse number 14. It says this, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. So people say, Hey, I'm preaching in the name of Jehovah. How many people say that today? I'm preaching in the name of Jesus or the name of Jehovah. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them. Neither spake unto them, they prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, saying it's nothing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesied my name, and I sent them not, yet they say sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. Notice what they're preaching to when they prophesy lies. Jeremiah's coming with like this negative message. Let me tell you the vision that I saw. This place is going to be destroyed. This place is going to be you know, laid to the ground. It's going to be leveled to the ground. When those prophets come, what do they say? All this positive. Peace, peace is exactly what they say. Yeah, all this positive stuff, but just only positive. You look at the visions people see today, and it? God appeared unto me, brother, and he told me everything's going to be all right. It's that kind of crap every time, isn't it? The Lord came to me, and he told me, you're going to live a great life. Don't worry about anything. It's always crap like that. You look at these stinking you know, TV uh, preachers and stuff that are claiming that God's giving them visions. You know what they are? They're exactly the same as these liars that, that God's talking about here. Amen. They fit the profile perfect. Every point. And this is something not to be taken lightly. I want you to look here in Deuteronomy chapter number 13. Deuteronomy chapter number 13. We're going to end here, actually. This is a good verse to end on. To end on a positive note. Deuteronomy 13, look at verse 1. It says, that there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. Notice the same language of Acts, too. Exactly, exactly the same language. And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after, after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. So this is a, an interesting situation because it's describing exactly what's talked about in Revelation 13. Saying he might give you a sign or a wonder. And, and if the sign or the wonder comes to pass, you know, he's saying that this is of God, right? This is of the Lord. But then what does he say? Hey, hey, let's go worship these other false gods now. Let's go worship, you know, this, this, this other Christ. Look at verse 3. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord, Jehovah, your God, proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart. Speaking to the whole nation of Israel, so make sure you understand the context. With all your heart, with all your soul, ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him <clears throat> and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. Now look at verse 5. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death. Because he has spoken to you, he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of Notice what a serious thing this is. You, know, you have, you know, like I said, this child saying he saw visions and dreams of heaven. You have all these people and all these churches going around saying, I saw this vision from God. I had this vision from God. How many times have you heard in your life? I mean, I've heard it tons. God appeared to me. God appeared to me. To help you understand the seriousness of this, look at Deuteronomy 13 and tell me what should happen to that person. You don't take things lightly like that. 
You know, whether or not maybe they're doing this out of ignorance and they've heard other people say it. They maybe, they grew up maybe in a Pentecostal church and they were just kind of brainwashed into this and they're young. They're maybe 18, 19 or something and they were like, God appeared to me. God came to me. Hey, let me tell you about this. We had somebody come in our church that was saying, I forgot about that until just now. That was saying that. God came to me and I saw God. I saw the face of God. And then they described you know, Caesar Borgia, you got long hair, Rome, right? That's not what God looks like. Yeah. So that's why I said most of the time you could peg him 99% of the time, like, no, uh, you did, right? But let me say this I don't believe people are having visions and dreams anymore. I don't think anyone is. I think the last person that had a vision and a dream, the last vision and dream was John. But the last person that was added to the group that even had the capability was Paul. That's it. And it's done. Right. There's no other signs. You know what they did? It says this. When it talks about the apostles, there were many signs and wonders wrought by their name. What is the sign and wonder in Deuteronomy 13? A vision and a dream. Isn't it? There's signs and wonders. That's what it's in Acts 2. It's talking about the visions and the dreams. And what are they doing? They're prophesying the word of God. They're one and the same. And they're speaking with another tongue. Aren't they? So, when people tell you today they're having a vision and a dream, they're lying to you. And I want you to understand the seriousness of that, and you need to explain to them. Maybe they'll stop more out of line, like, hey, you can tell them in a nice way, you know. But hey, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the Bible says that if a person says that they have a vision or a dream, go look at Deuteronomy chapter number 13. It says that person, if they're lying, should be put to death. That's what God thinks about someone saying they had a vision and a dream from God, and he didn't really send them. Go to go point them to Jeremiah 14 of this passage and how it describes these prophets. They prophesy and they lie deceits out of their own hearts for the whole purpose to turn them away. Exactly what Deuteronomy chapter number 13 says. Hey, that's not something to take lightly. Don't come around me telling me you had visions and dreams. I know nobody here's gonna do that. They, yeah. Hey brother, let me tell you about this vision I had last night. It's like that's not happening anymore today. The cannon's closed. And it ended with the book of Revelation. And at the very end, that's why it ends like this. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Could you have imagined a more perfect conclusion of this book? Right. That was the last scripture that was written down by anybody. That was probably the last vision and the last dream that any man of God ever saw. Ever. To this day. So... Somebody tells you they had a vision and a dream. You, you need to correct them going forward. <coughs> Say, hey, man, let me show you Deuteronomy 13, and hopefully this stops you from doing that. Because the Bible says you know, that the apostles were the ones doing that, and there was a rare occasion where it was a miracle, and it was a huge deal where the, the Spirit was poured out, poured out upon all flesh in that case. And it was fulfilled in Acts 2. So that's, that's, that's something that we need to not take lightly. You know, when people are coming, even coming to us and saying, obviously you don't, you don't need to just like go all ham on these people like, you shut your stinking mouth, tie them up, you know what I mean? But explain to them, yeah, explain to them like, hey, that's super wicked, man. You may not be aware of this, but that's really evil. And there's, there's, there's horrible people that did that all throughout the Bible. Their intent was to turn people away from the word of God. And whether they know it or not, if they're telling you something that's contrary to this book, even if they're ignorant of what the Bible says, and they say something opposite, they're turning you away from this book is what they're doing. And they're trying to get you, hey, let me tell you about this vision. You trust in there. Now you have to make a decision in your own mind. Do I believe this vision or do I believe the word of God? And if you chose, oh, I think his vision might be right. That's turning people away from the word of God, isn't it? That's wicked. That's evil. Don't take that lightly. It's about our heads and a word of prayer. But Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for all the doctrine on so many different subjects, dear God. Help us to be interested in all the Bible. Dear God, not just, you know, uh, uh, things that we just have the inherent desire.